Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Medisodes. This week, we're going to be talking about a relatively new specialty in the field of medicine, and one that changes a lot at how we look at end of life care. The specialty I'm talking about, of course, is palliative care. Palliative care, derived from the Latin root palliare, or to cloak, is an interdisciplinary medical caregiving approach aimed at optimizing quality of life and mitigating suffering amongst people with serious complex illness. Many definitions of palliative care exist. However, the World Health Organization describes it as an approach that improves the quality of life of patients and their families facing the problems associated with life-threatening illness through the prevention and relief of suffering by means of early identification, impeccable assessment and treatment of pain, as well as other problems, physical, psychosocial and spiritual. To boil it down, palliative care does not look to cure people of their diseases or ailments. Instead, it looks to make to mitigate the symptoms and make those symptoms less affecting of their way of life. It's, this is especially important with diseases which have no cure, such as types of cancer. In the past, palliative care was a disease specific approach, but today the World Health Organization and organizations around the world take a broader approach that the principles of palliative care should be applied as early as possible to any ultimately fatal illness. Palliative care, contrary to popular belief, is appropriate for individuals of any age with serious illness and can be provided as either the main goal of care or in tandem with curative treatment. It is provided by an interdisciplinary team, which can include not only their doctors and physicians, but also nurses, therapists, psychologists, social workers, dietitians, etc. Palliative care can also be provided in a variety of contexts, not just hospices, also including hospitals, skilled nursing homes, and assisted living centers. Although an important part of end of life care, palliative care is not just limited to individuals near the end of their life. And as a specialty, it has only really existed for less than 60 years, growing out of the hospice movement of the late 1960s. And this was commonly agreed to have begun in 1967 with the founding of the first hospice, St. Christopher's in the UK by Dame Cicely Saunders, widely regarded as the founder of the hospice movement. Later on in 1969, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross published her book on death and dying, and this book was a landmark moment in the field of psychology of death. In it, she defined the very famous five stages of grief through which many terminally ill patients progress, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Although we now believe dying patients do not necessarily go through all these phases and they do not necessarily occur in a set order, her book and her lectures helped raise public consciousness about care for patients at the end of their lives. The term itself, palliative care, was coined in 1974 by Balfour Mount, a urologist who was inspired by the work of Saunders and Kubler-Ross and who was working at the Royal Victoria Hospital in Montreal, Canada. He founded the first palliative care ward in the world there that year. And around the same time, a doctor, Paul Henteleff, became the director of a new terminal care unit at St. Boniface Hospital in Winnipeg, Canada. The developments continued to grow throughout the 1980s. In 1980, the federal government in the US mandated that hospice care would be covered by Medicare, the main insurance company for healthcare in the US. Then in 1987, Declan Walsh established a palliative medicine service at the Cleveland Clinic Cancer Center in Ohio. This later expanded to become the training site of the first palliative care clinical and research fellowship, as well as the first palliative care inpatient unit in the United States. In 1990, the World Health Organization officially recognized palliative care as a distinct specialty dedicated to relieving suffering and improving quality of life. Then, 16 years later, the American Board of Medical Specialties recognized hospice and palliative care as its own specialty. But how does palliative care actually work? Where does it happen and for who? This is what Shrey is going to be talking about next. So in the UK, palliative care is provided by a mixture of the NHS and uh, charities such as St. Christopher's. So in the NHS constitution, it promises 
to support people whenever they cannot fully recover to stay as well as they can at the end of their lives. The right to palliative care is also a, as part of the human right to health. As part of the holistic healthcare provided by the NHS's, NHS's cradle to grave service, palliative care involves people from multiple different fields and departments, such as doctors, social care, community nurses, physiotherapists, and also hospice workers, whether that be an NHS hospice or a charity hospice, such as St. Christopher's. Also, if the person is living in a care home, care home workers will have a role within that to make sure that the resident is as comfortable as possible during their end of life. There's also a role for family and friends if the patient is being cared at a home and the person's GP will have overall responsibility for that patient's care. The person may wish to write a living will or advanced statement which tells the people caring for them what they do and do not want. They can write an advanced decision to refuse treatment known as an ADRT, which is legally binding and sets out which treatments they want and which treatments they don't. For example, they might decide a uh, do not resuscitate order and a DNR or DNA CPR, do not attempt CPR. They may also transfer lasting power of attorney to a close friend or family member, but it's important to note that this is for only health decisions rather than financial ones. Let's move on to when you'll be given palliative care. It is provided to people who are thought to be in the last year of their life, although if you feel you need palliative care before that, you can ask your GP and they can refer you to a palliative care centre. People in the last year of their life are assessed to be, are, are considered if they're frail and have coexisting conditions that make them vulnerable. They have advanced incurable illnesses, such as advanced cancer, motor neuron disease and dementia, or if they have existing conditions if they're at risk of dying, or if they have existing conditions that may have a risk of dying from sudden crisis in their condition. They may also have a life-threatening condition caused by a sudden catastrophic event, such as an accident or a stroke. Although a palliative care is mostly associated with elderly people, it's important to note that anyone at any age nearing the end of their life can receive palliative care. And receiving palliative care does not mean that you're necessarily going to die within a few weeks. Many people actually receive palliative care for many years, depending on their condition. And palliative care will also be provided alongside treatments, therapies, and medicines that try to control your illness, such as chemotherapy and radiotherapy. Now we've talked about when and who provides palliative care. On to Adrian, who'll be talking about what treatments are given within palliative care. I'm now going to be covering the treatment techniques that are used in palliative care. Palliative care, unlike more traditional forms of medicine, is much less reliant on drugs to cause physical healing, but rather relies on a softer approach to care. Palliative care is fundamentally different than end-of-life care in that it can start in any per time in a person's life, whereas end-of-life care is usually implemented in the final year. The treatment techniques used for palliative care are designed to help the patient enjoy as fulfilling a life as practical, providing support in every possible way through their final years of life. Palliative care is split into five stages, though they are not distinct and have some overlap. For palliative care is a continuous process and not fragmented like it is, for the sake of learning and explanation. The first stage is where the initial plan is created and needs to remain flexible. This is because illnesses are unpredictable, and so the care needs to be able to adapt and change course suddenly should the patient's health change unexpectedly. This stage involves the patient's family and the appropriate healthcare professionals including the patient's general practitioner and specialist for the illness that the patient suffers from. And all these people together will formulate a plan for the future that all are happy with. It is important that the patient too plays an active role in forming this plan. It is the remaining days of their life that they are planning, so it is only fair that they have a say. At stage two of palliative care, medical social workers, interdisciplinary teams and a chaplain are assigned to the patient, their family and friends, to provide emotional and, if applicable, spiritual care. This is important to prepare them for the. This is important to prepare them suitably for the death of the patient. At stage three, doctors and other healthcare professionals work together to ensure that the patient maintains as much independence as possible. 
And to ensure this, it may be necessary to install home health aids and a nursing assistant to help with daily activities that the patient is struggling with. Stage four involves arranging inpatient care at the hospice or hospital, if desired. If this isn't desired, then live-in care may be designated, so the patient can always get the support they need without moving out of their comfort zone. This stage can also mark the beginning of end-of-life care. Finally, stage five involves bereavement support for the patient's family and friends, and usually lasts a year. These five stages outline the treatment pathway for a patient with terminal illness projected to die. It helps the patient to make the most of their remaining lifetime and helps their relatives and friends cope with the loss of a loved one better. However, it is important to note that these are the ideal stages of palliative care and, rea and in reality, palliative care may not strictly follow the five stages. Palliative care treatments are also much more varied than standard medical treatments. Meditation is used to comfort both the terminal ill patient and their close family and friends. It is a way for these people to accept the news that the patient's life is coming to an end. In turn, this means that the remaining time for the patient will be more fulfilling and they're less likely to be constantly worrying about their death and their close family and friends will be able to cope with the death better, lessening the grief and shock when the patient does eventually pass away. As mentioned before, palliative care aims to allow the patient as fulfilling a life as possible and a part of this involves lessening as much of their pain. Most pain problems can be controlled using the World Health Organization's step care approach. A first step starts with a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, such as ibuprofen or aspirin. For more information on aspirin, be sure to check out Medisode's episode 18, where we discuss this specific drug and its uses in a lot more detail. If pain continues to get worse despite these drugs, pain control progresses to the second step, where the healthcare provider may prescribe a weak opioid medicine which may be combined with a non-opioid pain reliever. Opioid drugs are the most effective and commonly used drugs for moderate to severe pain. A wide range of opioid drugs are available, but their use is controlled because a patient will almost certainly develop a tolerance to the one they are taking, and the dosage will gradually have to be increased to get the same effect as before. If the pain continues to get worse, the healthcare professional progresses to the final of the three stages of the step care approach to pain management which involves the prescription of a stronger opiate, for example, morphine. If a patient is at the stage where they're receiving palliative care, then the healthcare is likely fragile, and surgery is the last thing that a healthcare professional may consider. However, surgery can be used to relieve specific symptoms in rare cases where all other measures do not work. For example, surgery may be recommended to stabilize a hip fracture in someone with advanced cancer. The surgery is not going to treat or cure the advanced cancer, but it may be the best way to reduce pain in the hips and improve the patient's mobility. The key principle behind this approach is to lessen the pain the patient is in, because the patient has a right to be as free of pain as possible. There is no reason to let pain decrease the quality of life, especially so when the patient is projected to die soon. These are the main mechanisms that are used in palliative care, pain management and emotional treatment but they all seek to achieve the same aims as the one I have outlined, and there are many other mechanisms that are involved. But this leaves open several questions. How ethical is palliative care letting patients die? Should palliative care be available in more places? For these, I will not hand back to Anupam. Palliative care is obviously something that is very widely discussed between doctor and patient, but also in wider society, due to the implications of, in a sense, giving up treatment on people when you know that there is no chance of recovery. Some would even argue that palliative care in itself is unethical because you're letting people die, not doing everything to save them. What if, for example, a brand new treatment is discovered days after you decide not to continue treatment on a patient for whom that treatment might have helped? Adrian, Shrey, what do you guys think? Do you guys think that palliative care in essence is unethical? I think that the main focus of medicine is to improve the patient's quality of life. And there's no way we can predict the future, but it is always unlikely that a new, a new treatment will be discovered days after the patient has died. And it's the case for many patients that a treatment isn't discovered after they die. And is it worth the money, the pain and the suffering of their family, friends and the patient 
to allow them to live as much as possible? Or is it easier and better overall to allow the patient to die peacefully and as less pain as possible? I think the latter is the case. So I believe palliative care is ethical because it provides the patient with the best possible quality of life while they are still here. One of the founding principles of medical ethics is patient autonomy. And it's important to note that patients can ask or refuse palliative care depending on what they think is best for their needs. And it'd be wrong to say to patients that you can't have palliative care if that's what they wanted. But if they feel like they do want to hold out for some miracle cure, that's also their choice as well. And that should be supported and doctors should be able to provide them with the best care possible within those circumstances. You raise an interesting point there, Shrey, about the patient deciding whether they want to switch to palliative care or not. But in a lot of cases, patients who are in a stage where they would need palliative care are often very much weakened by the diseases ravaging their body and are not often in the right state of mind to make these very important decisions. Do you think patients should always get a say in their choice to take palliative care? Or do you think the doctor's opinion should be the one that's followed when it's down to choosing whether to take up palliative care or not? I believe palliative care is not just for the patient, it's for the patient, their family, their friends, relatives and anyone who cares for them deeply and it depends on the illness of course but the state of mind of the patient must be assessed and in all cases possible the doctor needs to give the patient a right to say how they want to spend the remaining time in their life but of course there are cases where this is not possible for example if a patient is in a coma and in this case a doctor should work closely with family and friends to ensure that they come to a unified conclusion to, so that all of them are happy with the next step stages of the patient's life. This also emphasizes the importance of having your wishes in writing in the form of either an advanced will or a living will or telling your family what you want in the event of this happening. And that can help to make it easier and also stuff like do not resuscitate orders are very important uh, to making sure that the patient gets their wishes because CPR can be very distressing for people as well. That's very true. It is shown that a lot of people when they make these decisions about DNRs don't really fully understand how dangerous the process of resuscitation can be and how unlikely it is that it actually works, especially in people already weakened by illness. An interesting fact about palliative care is actually that people who choose to take palliative care, although some people see it as giving up, actually live longer than those who don't receive palliative care, and they definitely have increased quality of life and less depression. For example, in 2010, the New England Journal of Medicine published a study which showed that people with lung cancer who received early palliative care as well as their standard oncologic care, experienced a quality of life increase and survived 2.7 months longer than those who didn't receive the palliative care. With those sort of numbers, it's hard to see why palliative care hasn't been adopted worldwide. However, the case is in a lot of low income and middle income countries, palliative care just isn't an option. When it comes to stuff like vaccines, richer countries see it as a duty to be able to deliver them to poorer countries. Do you think they should also be obligated to deliver palliative care to those countries as well? If higher income countries were obligated to deliver palliative care to low income countries, then we could apply the same to so many other treatments that aren't available in other places. And then there comes a point where we have to draw the line because high income countries do not have an infinite budget. Although it would be ethically moral to deliver palliative care to these lower income countries. I think more important treatments and more immediate treatments such as the vaccines now in this pandemic should be prioritized. Of course, if we do have the resources, then delivering palliative care would be a benefit because everyone has a right to have the best positive. Everyone has a right to have the best possible quality of life and to live in the least amount of pain possible. 
also uh, with countries, rich countries, um, especially in the West, especially with such a sensitive field such as palliative care, um, we need to make sure that we're respecting local morals or local ways of doing stuff, especially around such things as end of life and death, because especially regarding culture and religion, they might have different views to those that are in the West. And if the West were to provide palliative care to their own standards, it might feel to the people in those countries that they're disrespecting their culture, which is obviously not very good. And we need to make sure, especially with such something such as so important, such as death, which has so many things such as religion, ethics, and morals such as that, we need to make sure that we're respecting that and adapting it to each country's cultural background. Well, in any case, I think we've really shed a light on what makes palliative care such a unique specialty and how important it really is to the modern way of delivering medicine, in which the patient's way of being and well-being is the primary focus, not just curing diseases. I hope everyone who's listening has enjoyed this episode and learned something about it. Be sure to tune in next week for another episode of Medisodes and remember to like, comment and subscribe on the video. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.